Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Michael Smith, the co-chair of the 2014 Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Committee and event, and we're delighted that you're here with us this afternoon. Fifty years ago, the March on Washington occurred for jobs and freedom. This afternoon, we are delighted to hear from various members of the university community. Those members were either at the march or part of the civil rights movement. And those two seminal events had major impact on their lives and their dedication to service to men and women of others to the District of Columbia community. I'm delighted to introduce Mr. Scott Fleming. He's the Associate Vice President for Federal Relations. And Scott will introduce Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton. Thank you all. In the District of Columbia, this is someone who truly doesn't need an introduction, so I guess that's why I get to do it, because everybody knows who she is. But I want to say that I've had the privilege of working with Congresswoman Norton over the last decade, and I think there's one phrase to me that describes this woman. She's a force of nature. It is an abomination that the representative of the District of Columbia does not have a vote in the House of Representatives. But I can only imagine what she will accomplish when she has a vote, because she achieves so much without that vote, much more than most, many of the members who have a vote. So we are very privileged that she is indeed Georgetown's Congresswoman. She is also a member of our Georgetown Law Center faculty. She has fought tirelessly for equal rights throughout her career. She was the first woman to serve as chair of the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission during President Carter's administration. And in the Congress, she works tirelessly on issues of civil rights, but also rights for the people of the District of Columbia. With that determination, I know that we will have a vote in Congress before long. I want to thank you for being here, Congresswoman. She was involved as well in helping plan that March on Washington, and I'm sure you will all be interested in her remarks today. Thank you for being here, Congresswoman. Thank you very much, Scott, <laughs> for your very generous in, uh, in introduction. Um, and I just want to tell you, Scott, I try to be uh, a force of nation, a force of, a force of nature only with certain kinds of Republicans. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, I just try to be myself. <laughs> um, whenever I speak at Georgetown, I feel right at home because I. I very much uh, value my continuing work as a member of the faculty of, of, the, of the law school. Um, <laughs> as I begin to teach every year, and I'm very pleased that, the, that uh, the university has arranged so that I can teach a um, semester long course all year. So I go every other Monday to the law school and I, I say to my students um, that I come back to the law school for a reason. I want to continue to uh, nurture my mind with people who still have one. <laughs> uh, I, value, I value the contact with young people. And I, I, I tell them, yeah, and you know, to tell you the honest goodness the truth, I, I come back because it was uh, harder to get tenure than it was to get elected. <laughs> <laughs> I'm coming right back and teach every single year. I said, no, 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 I come back because of you. And I do because it really is a, a very fertilizing to the mind always to be uh, among young people and to have to think again what you thought about yesterday because this is a new day. Um, so when I was asked to say a few words before your panel on the 85th birthday of Martin Luther King Jr., I, I certainly thought I had to, to do so both as a, a member of the faculty and because uh, I believe that what you, you do this week in, in honoring Martin Luther King, what he stood for is in itself pardon me, so, so very important. Now, uh, I suspect that you'll be hearing from your panel who 
have had various roles themselves in the civil rights movement or around the march or in Washington, their own recollections. So I don't know why I should, be, I, should, I should go any differently from what I expect them to do. Um, so I thought I would tell you about, especially as I'm speaking on campus, uh, which reminds me very much of where I was um, as the civil rights movement reach, was reaching its crescendo. Um, I yearned uh, for the summers when I could, could go south and be engaged in the civil rights movement. Um, uh, in the summer of um, 63, and I understand many of those or some of those who will speak will speak about uh, their own involvement in the March on Washington. In the summer of 63, I had been recruited by Bob Moses to come into the South to prepare for what was to become the um, summer of 64 when, when already was on his mind to bring students from around the country into Mississippi to try to expose uh, what had yet to be exposed about that state. It was known for its terrorism, but the fact is that those of us who were in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, we called ourselves SNCC, um, had been engaged in states all around Mississippi. But Mississippi alone had not been penetrated. Um, And the question came, and here is where Moses was such a strategic thinker, how to do it. Uh, there were very few native Mississippians who were engaged in an indigenous movement. Uh, the late uh, Aaron Henry, who was the uh, president of the state NAACP in Clarksdale, Mississippi, uh, did not come from our movement of nonviolent protesters. He was a pharmacist. He had the nerve, the guts, to be the state president of the NAACP. Uh, and he had uh, a shotgun right there so that the Klan knew he was there. He, 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 he just made no, he, he was not from the nonviolent movement, <laughs> shall we say. Um, I don't ever recall that Aaron Henry ever engaged in uh, a, a, an act of having to shoot his gun, but it was, must have been a powerful deterrent. Uh, when I came into Mississippi in 63, um, there were literally a handful of youngsters. Uh, I came into D Jackson, Mississippi first. And the first sit-ins had just occurred in Jackson. This is in 63. Sit-ins had swept the country but the first sit-ins were held by Meg Evers of the NAACP chapter, the state chairman of the NAACP, because of the difficulty of getting people to subject themselves to near death if you sat into a, a sat at, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a fountain in, in Mississippi. And when I came into Jackson uh, that June, uh, Meg, uh, tried to convince me. I was a law student, Yale Law School. It was the summer. Uh, Bob Moses had been in New Haven um, recruiting, actually raising money for the movement. Um, I had promised to go into <coughs> the Delta, but there were so few people on the ground who identified with the movement that Mega Evers tried to convince me to stay in um, Jackson. And I said, oh, how could I do that? I promised I'd come to the Delta. So he took me all around Jackson to the several offices of the NAACP. I spent the whole day meeting and talking with people. That evening, 
he took me um, to the bus station. Uh, and I got on the bus for about a three-hour ride into the Mississippi Delta, uh, Greenwood, Mississippi. Um, this is my way to the march. But I did not know it at the moment. Um, I came to a farmhouse, and the SNCC people put me up with... Uh, some farmers, they told me that they would be gone by the time I got up. They gave me something I had never experienced before. They gave me this tin tub and said that's how to bathe, and they showed me how to heat the water. Uh, and they said that right up the street is the SNCC office. Uh, I was in that tin tub when a child, no long, must not have been any more than 10 years old, knocked on the door and said, they want you up there, they want you up there. Aren't you the student who just come? I said, yes, I'll try to get there as soon as I can. What in the world has happened? And she said, Mega Evers has been shot and killed. That was my baptism into the state of Mississippi. I hurried my clothes on, went up to the SNCC office, and recognize that the reason they wanted me to, 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 to come up there is that there were no adults there. Um, Bob Moses was in the north um, fundraising. Um, the one other student, college student, Lawrence Giot, had gone to get Fannie Lou Hamer out of prison because she had been arrested traveling on interstate, uh, in interstate commerce, as we say in the law, traveling on a bus uh, from Georgia to Mississippi for getting off the bus to, to use the ladies' room. When she was arrested, the word came that someone had to come from uh, Greenwood to Winona, Mississippi to get her out of jail. And Long came Giot, who was the closest thing to an adult among those present. Except that he then had been put in jail. So here was I, a law student, uh, with a bunch of really juveniles, saying, well, what do you think we do now? Uh, well, I thought I'd engage in a little fact-finding. <laughs> I learned that much in law school. So I just questioned them over and over again about what, had ha what they knew about people in the area, what had happened before. I asked question after question, and they told me at one point that though the white citizens' councils um, marched around the SNCC office every other evening, it looked like the police chief was not in the Klan because uh, he did not seem to be among them. He wasn't one of us, but he did not seem uh, to be among them. That, <laughs> once they told me that, I said, well, I've got an idea. Because I, obviously I want to go to Winona. I mean, how could I not? Uh, the, the rest of those who were there were kids, and I use that word advisedly, these were children. Those are the only people young and foolish enough to be engaged in nonviolent direct action in the summer of 63 in Mississippi. So I had to go, but I certainly didn't want to walk into the, to the arms of the Klan. So when they told me about this police chief, I said, well, would you take me to him, please? And um, I sat down and talked with this man. <laughs> what do you say to him? I said, look, they tell me you try to maintain law and order around here. My name is Elna Catherine Holmes. I'm from Washington, D.C. I told him about the others who had been in jail, in jail, put in jail. And I said, obviously, it now falls to me to go to see if I can get the others out. I said, now look, I don't see why I ought to go to jail just for trying to get them out of jail. 
So all I can tell you is I've called everybody I have heard of in Washington. I called the dean of Yale Law School. I called my mom and father and told them to call everybody they ever heard of. So everybody knows that I'm going over there. I didn't think that was much of a deterrent if he was a Klansman, but I did want him to know that I wasn't going over there unbeknownst to the world. And so I went. Uh, when I got there, um, they said, yes, I could see the prisoners. They went inside to get Lawrence Giot first, except that Lawrence had to, before I could see him, he had to put his clothes on. He had been let out in the evening the night before to the White Citizen Council that had beat him so badly that he was sitting there with nothing on, clothes hurt, hurt him. He put on something so that, so that I could see him and see that he was well. And then they let me see a woman who was to become uh, one of my mentors, Fanny Lou Hamer, the great Fanny Lou Hamer, whose capacity to draw people to the movement and to courage was unequaled by any person I have ever known except for Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, Ms. Hamer had been beat unmercifully by a black trustee who had been told that <laughs> she better beat and you better beat her harder and harder or you will be beat harder and harder. Such was the cruelty and the punishing um, lives of blacks who dared uh, to challenge the system uh, in the early 1960s. Of course, Fannie Lou Hamer had already walked off of a plantation, the only life she'd ever known, after registering to vote. So her courage was somehow endemic to her personality when she had the opportunity to express it. Um, so I, uh, uh, Bob Moses came back and I began to teach a little workshop. And uh, I don't know, I did not go back in 64. In 64, I helped write the brief for the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, which challenged the all-white exclusionary delegation to the uh, Democratic Convention. Uh, but I do know that my job was <laughs> to develop a prototype, a prototype of, a, of a workshop to accustom people to the kind of questions they would be asked when they went to vote and, and how not to get upset uh, by such questions and how to receive them. Um, around halfway through the summer, I got a call from friends of mine in New York, who I knew well. There had been rumors that the March on Washington, a March on Washington, uh, was in the works. If, we could, if they could possibly get it together. And the, my, my, one of my good friends called and said, Ellen, it's going to happen. If you want to be part of it, you got to come back now. And I flew back uh, to join the staff of, of the March on Washington. Um, I had been one of a number of young people who had been mentored by Bayard Rustin. And she said, Bayard's going to do it. And he says, you want to help us? The time has come because we are going to do it. Um, this um, was a, a moment in, in the civil rights movement like none other. I mean, here I was in Mississippi, the last place, the last place, the last gasp uh, of, of the movement. And yet, all around the South, the virtual preparation for, this, for the 63 March on Washington had been made through 10 steady years of demonstrations and sacrifice. So if you think about it, there really was nothing left to do 
but bring it all to Washington. We brought it to every place from Albany, Georgia, uh, to <coughs> the tips of Arkansas, Tennessee, and, and Louisiana, all around Mississippi, and now we were in Mississippi. Uh, and yet, the source of remedy remained untouched. And that, of course, was Washington, D.C. So for me, the call to come back home, my hometown, my disempowered hometown, which didn't even have a, a, a government, it had no mayor, no city council, no democracy, no member of Congress to come home to the seat of power where the most disempowered lived, that seemed to be a calling to come home. Of course, where I came was to New York because Rustin organized the March on Washington out of uh, Brownstone 135th and 135th and Lenox. Um, and that was a, a moment of, of the greatest uh, promise and the greatest uh, uncertainty. Um, this much is sure. If you think about 1963 and marches, um, you will be hard pressed to, to find in the history books a march that could be called a mass march before the 1963 march on Washington. Um, that meant that there was no reservoir of talent and strategy as to how to pull it off. That particularly frightened uh, Washington, John F. Kennedy and, and, uh, and all who were here. But it really meant that finding somebody who could lead the march in its nuts and bolts was no small task. Now, finding leaders of the march wasn't difficult at all. There were six great civil rights leaders, all of them uh, extraordinary men, and add to them Dorothy Height, who did not speak at the march because no woman spoke. Um, but these were extraordinary men, and then there was the real great man among them, A. Philip Randolph, who had organized a trade union movement when there was no National Labor Relations Act, when organizing black men for anything was a, an unbelievably difficult thing to do. Here was the grand master of the march, but who was to put it together? In my judgment, uh, there was only one man in the United States who could have put that march together, and his name was Bayard Rustin who had been involved in nonviolent uh, sit-ins as a youth, who when, when A. Philip Randolph had, had threatened the march on Washington during World War II, had been his, his youthful lieutenant then, Roosevelt called it off uh, uh, because Randolph threatened to march on Washington. This time, the threat was real. He was going to march on Washington, and a now fully matured by Rustin, who was a man of the labor movement, a man of a, 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 a great pacifist, a man of, 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 of enormous political sophistication, a man of the real world was going to do it. And he did it in, in, in the most extraordinary fashion. fashion. Um, on the, the, the night before the march, Byatt uh, called us to a, yet another staff meeting and said, well, somebody's going to have to stay in this brownstone tonight because you know there are going to be people calling and saying, I need to catch a bus. Where do I get a bus? Where do I get a train to go to this march? And as a native Washingtonian, uh, that was a task I wanted because I knew, first of all, I get to, I, I get to go on an airplane. <laughs> not one of those crowded buses. But I also knew what you could see from a plane. 
And because I would be going in the morning, not early morning, but in the morning, a long, long enough time to know whether or not there would be any people there, look like any people were on the ground, I volunteered to, to stay in that brownstone that evening. And uh, as I flew into Washington, I must say, I could not, it was before the march began, but you could see that people had driven all night and there were clumps of people on the ground, just clumps. I thought they were our people. They turned out to be our people. In fact, they turned out to be our people so much that after the leadership went into the White House, a little tardy getting out, the march started without them. And the leaders had to rush to the head of the march in order to lead uh, the march. Um, for me, it, the, 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 the notion of being a kid uh, in SNCC, helping to uh, develop the march coming up from Mississippi and now seeing the march spread before me meant that my life was going to change, and surely it has. Um, everyone speaks of the speeches, sure. Uh, my only regret is that uh, one cannot get an appreciation for all the speeches. Because I must say, as I listened to each speech, I was absolutely floored by the brilliance of these moving speeches, so that by the time they got around to Martin Luther King Jr., all I could think was, all right, brother, you better be good. Because <laughs> the ones who had preceded him were all so extraordinary. It was as if the moment had brought it all out of out of each and every one of the speakers. And of course, King um, uh, did not uh, disappoint. Since then, uh, every march has, in a real sense, patterned itself on the 1963 march on Washington. Yes, it is a tribute to the great leaders of that march. And for me, it is a tribute to the man who learned what I think uh, young people at Georgetown are learning today, learn to organize, and you will be able to do anything. He learned to organize. He organized, as far as I was concerned, the whole world that day. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, Congresswoman Norton has to return to the Hill for some important matters. We would ask now our panel members to uh, go up to the stage. So let me first introduce Reverend Bryant Osvig. Reverend Osvig is Director of Protestant Chaplaincy here at Georgetown University, and he'll be serving as moderator this afternoon. Uh, to Reverend Osvig's left is Professor Deborah Tannen. Uh, she's the university professor in the Department of Logis uh, Linguistics. Dr. Tannen has been a member of the Linguistics Department here at Georgetown University since 1979. She is one of six in the College of Arts and Sciences, who hold a distinguished rank of university professor. In addition to her 15 academic books and over 100 scholarly articles, she has written seven books for the general audience. The best known of these is You Just Don't Understand, Men and Women in Conversation. That made the New York Times bestsellers list for over four years. Dr. Tan has been a McGraw Distinguished Lecturer at Princeton University and has twice been a fellow at the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University. She holds five honorary doctorates. I'm taking a peek as I'm looking at Father Raymond Kemp. Father Kemp is Special Assistant for Community Engagement with the Office of the President here at Georgetown University. Father Kemp is a DC native and a priest of the Archdiocese of Washington. Father Kemp serves as the Special Assistant for the President He's an active member of the Georgetown University community and the District of Columbia communities and engages with students on issues of biblical and social justice. As an adjunct professor in the Department of Theology, Father Kemp teaches the church and the poor in the fall semester and struggle and transcendence in the spring. He is most passionate about preaching the just word, which is a course he's done for many years. He is passionate about many things. As part of the Preaching the Just Word, Father Kemp is currently working on a manuscript with Sister Nancy Sheridan. 
Next, we have Professor Richard America. He's an adjunct professor at the McDonough School of Business. Professor America has published on economic development in distressed areas, small and medium enterprises, development in Africa, corporate philanthropy and community development, and social marketing and community revitalization. He's written many books. His books include such titles as Developing the Afro-American Economy, Moving Ahead, Black Managers in America's Business, The Wealth of Races, he was an editor, and finally, Paying the Social Debt, Philanthropy and Economic Development. Professor America uh, has been a lecturer and director of urban programs at the Business School at the University of California in Berkeley. He is currently completing a new book on unjust enrichment, poverty, and inequality. Next to Professor America is Rabbi Harold White, who's a senior advisor, program for Jewish civilization. Rabbi White first came to Washington in the summer of 1968. For more than 40 years, he has created an interreligious home here at Georgetown University, which started with a faithful question. What would a Jesuit university need a rabbi when Georgetown did not even have Jewish students? Over the course of many years, Rabbi White has developed a deep appreciation for the connection between Judaism and the Jesuit tradition and values. One of his favorite memories is the creation of the Hallelujah Shabbat, which he believes reflects a shared spiritual journey and embodies what he calls uniquely Georgetown's traditions. We're delighted this afternoon that our members of the community are willing to share their recollections of the March on Washington and the Civil Rights Movement and how those major incidents and seminal moments in history have impacted their lives and have contributed to their mission and teaching and legacy here at Georgetown University. I turn it over to Reverend Oswick. So Father Kemp, um, <clears throat> we heard uh, from the Congresswoman sort of the stage that was set for her in 1963 through that summer and what she was doing. Can you, can you talk a little bit about sort of that experience leading up to the march and your experience at the march in 1963? Um, Reverend O, let me uh, take a deep breath and tell, first of all, the context. I was very much interested in civil rights, but I was in a thing called a seminary. Now, I don't know whether <laughs> most people know what a seminary was like back in those days, but it was, uh, a little bit like being locked up for nine and a half months a year. I could follow some things on TV. I was very much involved virtually, but I could not participate in a lot of things except for summertime. Came a time in the summer of 63, let me date myself, I had just graduated from undergrad and I was about to head into theological study. So it's um, a pretty interesting summer as one who teaches juniors and seniors. I think I can relate back to those days and times when I was thinking about what was in front of me. Um, my participation in civil rights was very limited. What I was aware of was that race was the defining issue in the United States of America. I was aware of it because I lived in the middle of what I thought was a segregated society. I had an invitation from the director of vocations I, the reason I put this on today was he invited us to get dressed up like this to be part of the March on Washington. A little bit of a presence there. And um, I gladly jumped into the fray. My personal confessor in my parish in Silver Spring, not eight miles from here, said, I would never go to the March on Washington. There's going to be incredible trouble. The tension's going to be crazy. Somebody's going to get stabbed. Join me in the middle of the Chesapeake Bay and we'll go fishing. I have to tell you that I was somewhat naive. I did not realize until he opened his mouth that there was that kind of tension around. Later when you read stories like Branch, right, Taylor Branch writes about it and others, you become aware of just how much consternation and concern there was that there was gonna be serious trouble. My experience of the march that day was 
don't wear black on the 28th day of August, number one, <laughs> especially on a very warm day. Find a shady spot. Third was, I have never had a greater experience of the mass of humanity, all colors, all shapes, all sizes, students, union types, civil rights workers, from young to old. It was the biggest almost festive kind of occasion that I can recall being a part of. Everyone knew that the time had come. Everyone was well aware that a, that a country was ready for something that was more than catharsis, was ready for a change. I can't even remember whether I was aware that a civil rights legislation had been proposed. What I knew was, I knew there was some trouble with a certain speaker who's going to be here in a couple of weeks, John Lewis, who signed a little book of mine earlier this year about the dream, um, that John Lewis was talking about a bit of a scorched earth policy, and the man who would ordain me four years later said he wasn't going to participate unless that um, General Sherman march to the sea rhetoric was, was toned down a bit. I, I knew something about that, and John Lewis did tone it down. And, and the Archbishop of Washington, Patrick O'Boyle, did give the invocation. Um, so there were a number of clergy types, all kinds of folks there. Uh, and it was, it was a series of speeches. What I, the one thing I remember for my students that are here is that it began with the <clears throat> keeping the memory alive of William Edward Burkhart Du Bois, who had just died that day or the day before in Africa. And I recall that name because I did not recognize that name. Just to tell you, um, some of your teachers were not too bright back in those days. And now I get to teach souls of black folk. And it's a, it's a great joy to open that book again and again. The second thing is that the speeches, while I'm sure the Congresswoman is quite correct, the speeches were good, but they were kind of steady. Um, there was. So, Singing in between, Peter, Paul, and Mary were there. I remember that. I remember John Baez. I remember people uh, remembering Medgar Evers who had passed away. I do recall when Dr. King was introduced. And I do recall, having heard him before on TV, a great deal of anticipation. We were not disappointed. I am not at all sure that what I am sure is, I didn't think we were making the kind of history we were making. But when he took Amos and Isaiah and put them together in a speech that I think galvanized not just the country, but the world, I knew that most of the preaching I had heard in most Catholic churches couldn't stand the test of time. This was, this was a change agent galore. And the expectation that the prophet was there in our midst was something that was very, very real. For me, it was foundational in everything I've done for the last past 50 years. Professor Tannen, uh, you were a student uh, as, as the march was getting going. What was your experience of it? How do you remember those speeches yeah. and that gathering? I'd love to talk about even you know the whole experience. Yeah. I want to start, though. We have all these empty chairs up here. Is there anybody in the back who'd be willing to move up closer? <laughs> Maybe you could hear better, and it would be nicer for us to see faces rather than empty chairs. <laughs> well, one person. OK, that's something. Thank you. <laughs> Two, three. Great. Um, thank you. When I was uh, interviewed for the job at Georgetown back in 1979, Father Cook was then chair of the department asked me, had I ever been to Washington? Had I, did I have an experience of Washington? And I said, I'd only been to Washington for protest marches. <laughs> I guess that said something about my background. <laughs> did not discourage him from hiring me, I'm glad to, to, to say. Uh, but yeah, I, I, was, um, I was an activist starting in high school. I, I'm from New York City, so I uh, went to high school in New York City. And um, there was the civil rights movement, the peace movement. Um, and not the women's movement, that, that came later, we didn't think about that. Um, the labor movement, as uh, Congressman uh, Holmes Norton said. 
Um, and so coming down to 1963, that summer was one of those, one of those marches. Um, so I, I want to just say something about the whole experience to give an idea of what, what it was like. Um, so this, I was 18 years old. And you know, last August was the 50th anniversary of the speech, so you can figure out how old I am. I was 18 <laughs> years old. I had uh, done one year of college. It was the summer between my freshman year of college. And uh, I was back home in New York City. <clears throat> New York City. Uh, I lived in Brooklyn. So I stayed overnight the night before uh, the march with a friend who lived in Manhattan. And we uh, were scheduled to get buses in Harlem at 4 o'clock in the morning. Now, for two young women to go alone to Harlem at 4 o'clock in the morning normally would be a little bit intimidating. And we were a little bit, a little bit nervous. Just showing up there, it's hard to explain how incredibly exciting it was. We turned up there on 125th Street, the main drag of Harlem. There were buses lining the street as far as you could see on both sides. Mm. There must have been <coughs> hundreds of buses. I'm, didn't count, but it was as far as you could see. And it could have been the middle of the day. So many people were there. Uh, and again, as uh, Father Ken said, um, all kinds of people, ages, uh, races, classes, and we all felt we were there for the same thing. And that was incredibly exciting. Um, I remember just kind of going up to somebody with a clipboard and asking which bus I should go into and being loaded on, onto a bus. Uh, we were not too far in the journey when there was a buzz through the bus that Richard Wright's widow was on our bus, that she was a great African-American novelist. Um, and something about celebrity, isn't it? You remember you were in the same bus as the celebrity. Um, I sat on a panel with uh, <laughs> Professor Tannen once. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, and, uh, as we were driving to Washington, when we passed other buses that we knew were going to the same place, it added to the sense of, of unity that you were all you know, part of the same, same great project. Um, we get to Washington, and again, as Congressman Norton said, these throngs of people. And I only have a couple of specific memories of incidents there. One memory I have is this anxiety, would I find the bus to go back? Because there were so many people and I didn't know Washington. I guess I did find the bus to go back because here I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, I remember. You didn't find the bus and you stayed here, right? <laughs> <laughs> On the issue of celebrity also, I remember I happened to see Peter, Paul, and Mary walking with their guitars. I, I, I can picture actually the tall one. I guess that was Paul with his guitar. That was very exciting. Um, and I remember. We, of course, there were so many people. You, you milled around for a long time before you got to March. Um, so I can picture being on the mall with other people that I knew and kind of, kind of standing up to do something. And the speeches were going on. I couldn't see. It was too far from the steps to see, but I could hear. And hearing Martin Luther King's voice and stopping dead in my tracks and just standing there, and standing there and listening to that, that whole speech. It was my first experience hearing uh, that preaching style. Uh, years later, 10 years later, after I'd been here at Georgetown, I actually did a project where I studied what are the linguistic elements that um, make up that style, the repetition, the patterns of uh, syntactic patterns that get repeated, the world play. Of course, at the time, I just experienced it. I wasn't analyzing what it was. So. Um, People ask, did, I, did, did we know at that moment that this was going to be remembered? Of course not. You know, I did know it was special um, because I remembered it. Um, but I think the overwhelming feeling, the same thing I would say that, that you said, was being part of something so big, feeling connected to all these people who were there for the same reason, people who in other situations you wouldn't feel that connection to again different so different i remember especially um we had stopped uh, for lunch because there was a lot of breakfast it must have been breakfast yeah on the bus ride and another uh, bus also stopped and it was a bunch of these of these working class white workers you know guys and it was the union unions had organized these buses also and 
Now, I also, the other marches I uh, engaged in, and for me it was all of a piece, and for Martin Luther King it was as well, and that was the anti-Vietnam War movement. I don't think those workers would have been quite as excited about the protests against the Vietnam War. Mm. But um, I know Rabbi White is gonna have more to say about that as well. But at that moment, feeling we're in this together and we're uh, working toward the same, um, same goal, um, the feeling that you're doing something, and I was one of 200,000 people at that march, so nothing like the Congresswoman and other people you hear from who really you know, played a role in organizing it, but feeling that you were actually doing something, that there was hope to make the world a better place, and you were part of it. Uh, I guess one last comment I'll make is how astonishing it is to realize that, not just that 50 years have passed, that's pretty astonishing right there, um, but that's something that at the time was counter-establishment, um, revolutionary in a way, rebellious certainly, has now become so establishment in itself. And I was in the post office and was looking at potential stamps to buy. There is now a stamp equality on the side, the, the 1963 March on Washington. Talk about a stamp of approval. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the post office is now endorsing um, this event. So, of course, I bought lots and lots of these, and I plan to put them on every, every envelope. I, every bill I pay, if I still pay bills with paper. <laughs> <laughs> One of the few, right? One of the few, yeah. So, um, yeah, so I think the overwhelming experience was being part of something so big and so important. Um, and the sense of connection that we had with the other people who were there. What, what I've appreciated hearing from both of you is sort of that sense of both sort of this pivotal historical moment, but also the personal real, which bus am I supposed to be on? <laughs> and we forget that people are probably wondering about, you know, <coughs> wait, are you going to be safe here? Is it a safe place to be? You know, what bus am I catching to get home? How am I going to get food? And sort of uh, that experience. And as I've read restrooms. through your stories and restrooms, where do you go to the bathroom? Um, but Professor America, uh, part of the conversation at the March on Washington wasn't just uh, about uh, equal rights, but also was very much about an economic sort of claim. Um, for as much as I, I both want to hear about your personal experience going to the march and of the march, you've also spent time since thinking about and writing about that economic claim that was being made at the march. Could you, could you say a little about that? Well, I can't, and uh, if I may, I, I prepared a few points. So uh, being from the business school, you forgive me if I uh, uh, approach it this way. Uh, and it fits the, the, the times, the pope, your boss, yes. is talking about poverty and inequality. God bless America, keep talking. Uh, and the president of the United States, and the conversation is in the air uh, on many levels, even, even in the corporate world. We are talking uh, a bit. Uh, carefully <laughs> of, about these matters. So I want to make seven points. The civil rights movement is an ongoing struggle since the 1600s. The 1960s phase that we're talking about today focused on mostly political participation, voting rights, end of desegregation, anti-discrimination, public accommodations, things that were uh, significantly achieved in legislation in 1964-65 three or four big pieces of legislation. Second point is that the march was one of several high points. But my, in my circles, and I, I was in, at Harvard Business School at the time, and I came down on a bus, uh, or a caravan of buses. My, my friends uh, at the time thought it too limited. We were more of the point of view of John Lewis, and our view at the end of the march was that anybody who talks about a dream must be sleeping. That was, so we came from a different part of the wide range of uh, philosophies uh, than Dr. King. We admired and respected him, but uh, his approach was not fully aligned with ours, let's to put it gently. Uh, the part of the speech that uh, I have emphasized, and, and many others, is the promissory note, not the dream so much. The promissory note is the key, and that refers to what in current terms would be reparations. And I've done two books and a number of articles 
on the public policy implications of the idea of reparations. The third point is that the movement had economic and developmental goals. These were coming into focus by 1967 when King's last book, Where Do We Go From Here, was published. And he laid out an economic program, which in some ways was well, significantly more uh, progressive, more radical, more assertive than his views at the time of the march in 1963. He grew, as we all do, his perspectives were changing, and by the time he wrote his last book, just before his death, he had arrived at a place that uh, I, I think it was closer to our view, frankly, in, in 1963, with the emphasis on economic development, economic justice, and public policies to, to match that vision. The fourth point is, has to do with unjust enrichment. And that is also, it's a phrase that he didn't use, may never have thought of, but is captured in some of, of his later thinking. Unjust enrichment has been uh, the crux of the race problem for 400 years. And I could, I, I won't develop that point now, but uh, that's receiving more attention, especially amongst uh, African-American economists and other progressive economists in the last couple of decades. Uh, fast forward to 2014, where do we go from here? Uh, to parity. Equality, but specifically equality or parity in median household income and wealth. The gap is still about 60%. Black family or household income is in the low 60s uh, compared to 100% uh, for the white uh, comparable measure. And the goal then, although it wasn't clear, uh, was parity. Parity became a word that uh, uh, was well understood in the early 70s by the members of the Congressional Black Caucus at that time. It has fallen out of use. Uh, the book I'm working on will, I hope, uh, restore it. I'm, I'm even thinking of using that as a title, parity. Uh, that was and, and is the goal. Median income equal by a date certain, and I pick a date of 2040. That means we would close that gap roughly at the rate of one percentage point a year. That seems simple. It would take a lot of work to do that and a shift in in the attitudes in, in the political realm as well. But, and here I put on my a hat that sounds somewhat conservative, uh, that requires lots of internal change, that kind of progress, in the African American community. And this raises Bill Cosby and other people who have, uh, who have spoken to this point in recent years. African Americans must change. I think if King were around, he would be making the same point. Uh, it's not, uh, uh, du Bois made the point. Franklin Frazier made the point, a sociologist. Uh, Frederick Douglass. There's a long history of, of uh, understanding and emphasis on this. I call it the development principle, which says if you want to achieve middle income, middle class uh, standard, then you do fairly common sense, practical things. You obey the law, you graduate from high school and finish some post high school education, take care of your health, refrain from having children until you're ready, 24, 25 years old. Uh, these are, are standards that are gonna have to become the norm if there's gonna be the kind of progress that we hope for. And the final point is we have institutions. We have the NAACP that Congresswoman Norton referred to. We have the Urban League. We have the NAACP Legal Defense Fund that several of my roommates uh, who were at Harvard Law School at the time went into uh, and went south to, to do legal work. We have Operation Push, Jesse Jackson, the United Negro College Fund. And this is a global issue as well. I, I teach courses on economic development in Africa. I've done a lot of work in Africa, so AfriCare, which is a local organization that works all over the world, 
the, another group that was formed in Philadelphia by the Reverend Leon Sullivan, who was a giant who passed away some years ago, the Opportunities Industrialization Centers. He has operations all over Africa. Contributions by 40 million black folks and everybody else who, who cares to contribute to these groups is essential if there's going to be progress. That has to also become a norm. Uh, so if they are strong and with broad support, uh, we can reach the goals and solve the problems that King was, was grappling with, that the march was really about in addition to basic civil liberties and, and, uh, and uh, civil rights that all citizens are entitled to. But economic development and the kind of economic progress that's required, these are the, uh, the basic elements of, of what has to happen over the next couple of generations. So uh, Rabbi White, uh, Professor America sort of highlights how this sort of um, civil liberties and sort of the early um, the argument for civil rights, you know, we're beginning to see that expand um, by the March of 1963 where we have the beginnings of claims of economic justice. Certainly the, the march itself was for, a, uh, had economic purposes behind it as well. Um, in your work with King and you know, your later meeting him, understanding that you weren't at the march, uh, in 1963, um, being a Navy chaplain stationed in Okinawa. Okinawa, okay, no, right. Yeah, so uh, that made it. No bus? Yeah, no, no bus. No bus is there. <laughs> no jets either at that time. <laughs> uh, but how did you experience sort of that expansion of sort of this understanding of what civil rights means is not just sort of equal access, but something much, much broader? Well, my experience with King was a turning point in my own life. Um, I met King. Uh, in the spring of 1964 at a rabbinical assembly uh, convention. Being in Okinawa, we didn't have the New York Times or even the Washington Post. So quite honestly, I knew very little about what was happening in the United States. I knew about the assassination of JFK. So the civil rights movement was not very familiar to me. And um, it's interesting to me uh, that the session with King uh, was a workshop. It was not a general assembly, and therefore there were only 30 rabbis who were present, and there were 325 rabbis who were at the assembly. Where were the others? Uh, the major workshop was on how to apply for a synagogue. So <laughs> most of my colleagues were there. Uh, I wasn't at that point interested, and I didn't even know if I wanted a synagogue. I really was always interested in academia. So I went to the one. Uh, with um, Dr. King. He was invited to it by Abraham Joshua Heschel, and they were very, very deep and close friends. In fact, uh, King said that he regarded Heschel as a father figure. Now, what impressed me about King and what made this great change in my life was that I'd never heard a Christian minister speak about the indebtedness of Christianity to Judaism. I had been more familiar with Christian pastors and ministers saying that the New Testament had superseded the Old Testament. And this really impressed me, that here was a minister speaking about the influence of Judaism upon Christianity. And what he spoke about was basically his relationship to the book of Exodus and the story of the liberation from Egypt. And he spoke about black theology. I never heard about black theology, a theology based upon that story in Exodus. And he spoke about his relationship to Moses and how the life of Moses had affected him. And he began with Moses' call. Namely, he hears an angel speaking out of a burning bush, who says that he will be a prophet. And Moses says, don't choose me. Choose someone else. I'm a stutterer. Choose my older brother, Aaron. And King said that this is the way that he felt when people referred to him as a prophet. Why me? Why me of all people? Choose someone else. And then he went on to explicate on other elements of that story. Uh, the one which fascinated me most was uh, his... Um, Description of Jesus, never heard this before, that he thought that as Moses was a political leader, he spoke to Pharaoh, Jesus was a political figure. 
And he gave an interpretation of the New Testament I'd never heard before, of the Beatitudes. Because I never understood why Jesus would say, blessed are the poor, blessed are the oppressed. And King interpreted this to mean that the poor and the oppressed had to become aware of the fact that they were poor and they were oppressed. And this was revolutionary language. I couldn't imagine a minister looking upon Jesus as a political figure. It fascinates me now because of the book The Zealot, which describes Jesus in those terms of a political figure and a zealot opposed to the oppression of the Roman Empire. That made a deep impression upon me. I'd never heard a minister speak about Jesus in that way. And he also went on to expound about the fact that Moses saw the promised land from afar and that he too would see the promised land from afar. The other thing that he was concerned about was leadership, leadership that would follow him. And he told the story of Moses, who Moses who was, had undertook and taken this leadership uh, single-handedly, and how his advisors said to him, now listen, you've got to spread the leadership. And so Moses appoints a council of 12 to assist him. And King said, this is too what I have to do. I have to raise up disciples, as Jesus raised up uh, disciples. And that had a long and deep impression upon me. One of the things that struck me was that he was very affected by uh, the book that Heschel had written. I had studied under Heschel for five years, called The Prophet. And King was very, very uh, moved by that book. But he said, I'm not sure if I'm a prophet or a priest. Because remember, in the biblical story, Moses is the prophet, and Aaron, his brother, is the priest. And the difference between the prophet and the priest is that the prophet is a zealot. He knows no compromise. But Aaron, the priest, is known for compromising. And King said, there are people who refer to me as a prophet, but I'm not sure I'm a prophet, and I'm not sure I'm a priest other. I think that I am a prophet priest. And I view King in that way, and I think that was uh, his success. Now, one of the stories that he told was how he had the privilege of being with Rabbi Heschel at his Seder. In fact, throughout the time that he began his involvement in the civil rights movement, until the time of his death, he always celebrated Passover at Abraham Joshua Heschel's table. And he remembered something that's in the Haggadah, which is the story of Passover, where it says, do not abhor an Egyptian, for remember, you were slaves in the, leave, in the land of Egypt. And he said, I would think the very opposite. You should abhor an Egyptian for what they had done to us. And he said, no, this is a message. This is a message that I have to send to the African Americans, that after this civil rights movement has been won, we must not abhor those who enslaved us, but we must remember Christian charity and the act of forgiveness. And that really had a deep and profound effect upon me. Where is the civil rights movement gone? Well, I'm not sure if King would think that it's really been a, had the success that he would have hoped that it would uh, have. But um, I remember uh, his humility and the, really the fact that he didn't think that he had done enough. Thank you all for sharing your stories of, of certainly the 1963 march. Um, and in a minute, we're going to open it up for any questions that you all may have. I just have a, a quick question for sort of all of our panelists. I know that you had, was that your only interaction with Dr. King or did you have future interactions with no, him? No, I had well? a future interaction, not directly with Dr. King, uh, but with the widow of uh, Jacob Rothschild. Jacob Rothschild was the rabbi of the temple in uh, Atlanta, and he was a very prominent civil rights um, activist. In fact, he gave one of the eulogies at Dr. King's funeral. And that interaction, which was told to me by his widow, Janice, a very good friend of mine, was the following. The Rothschilds invited the Kings to dinner at their home. 
And the kings had never been to that area. It was a white, middle, upper middle class neighborhood. And they got lost. There were no GPSs at the time. And they didn't know what to do. So they stopped at a house, which they thought was in the area. And Coretta Scott King went to the door, and she rang the doorbell. And she said to the woman who answered the doorbell, listen, we're hired help. We're going to the home of Rabbi Jacob Rothschild. My husband is going to be the bartender, and I am going to be one of the servers. Can you tell me if you know where the Rothschilds live? And the woman said, yes. She lives, they live two blocks down the way. And then they left. But she recognized Coretta Scott King. Four days later, the temple was bombed by a members of the Ku Klux Klan who were indicted, but they were never convicted. And almost immediately after that dinner party, the Rothschilds began to receive threatening calls about the fact that they had entertained the kings, which tells us the, how, how hard segregation and racism was at that time, that the kings had opposed as hired help in order to be present at the table of a prominent rabbi. Did uh, any of the other three panelists have an opportunity to hear King again, or any other future interactions with Dr. King? I heard him again in D.C. when a group of ministers were trying to help get <coughs> things organized here, and I also heard his widow, Coretta, after he had been assassinated. I also by 1967, I find myself ordained, and by April the 4th, 1968, I'm sitting at the corner of 15th and V, and so um, the day that King was shot in Memphis, we were assembled a block away at 15th and V from the Poor People's Campaign headquarters, which was on the corner of 14th and U. Um, that night after he had died, uh, a number of young people from the 1400 block of W Street came and sat with three of us in the rectory at then St. Paul and Augustine's, now St. Augustine's, and said, um, you guys have pretty well walked wherever you wanted to, but tonight we're going to make sure that nobody walks in here. And um, so it's kind of the reverse thing. Okay. We're going to protect you because um, this is going to get a little wild. And while it did, and I came to understand what tear gas was about, and I also came to understand what repression had been and what happens when that, that whole thing just kind of blows. And the amazing thing to me was how um, Washington, D.C., shocked at first, begins to come together and begins to rebuild in ways that I'm not entirely sure I've fully grasped yet, but it's an ongoing process and we're seeing it now. Brian, one of the things that Deborah alluded to was the relationship between the civil rights movement and the protest against the war mm -hmm. in Vietnam. Um, and I, I was a freedom writer uh, and during that period of time, I was in Alabama and Mississippi. You might have to say what it means to be a freedom rider. Oh, a freedom rider were people who took buses, basically clergy, down to the South in order to help uh, voters uh, register. So we were all involved in that. And one of the interesting things about that was that my, was that my congregation was very amenable to my going. In fact, they encouraged me to go. It's rather unusual because boards of congregations usually have, a, you know that, you're a minister, <laughs> have a firm grip on allowing their, 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 their rabbis to, to leave. And so they were very, very encouraging and very, very freewheeling in allowing me to do so. Now, King and Heschel bonded, not only in the civil rights movement, but also in terms of the Vietnam War movement. In fact, um, they walked hand in hand with uh, Abraham Joshua Heschel carrying a Sefer Torah, a scroll of the Torah, into Arlington National Cemetery, for which 
King didn't get criticized, but Heschel got criticized. But here is he was a rabbi bringing a Sefer Torah into a cemetery. So they really united on that because they believed that the Vietnam War was an immoral war and that it was the enemy of the poor. Because who was being conscripted? Poor people. People who did not have the opportunity to be in college or couldn't hire a psychiatrist who would attest to the fact that they were mentally deficient and incapable of serving in the military. Now one of the fascinating aspects of this for me was that as much as my congregation in Ann Arbor accepted and encouraged me to participate in the civil rights movement, they were totally opposed to my participation in the anti-war movement. And it was a very bitter experience for me because many of them who had been my friends, whom I had shared experiences with, life experiences and death experiences in doing funeral, turned against me. And I realized it was because and many of them were in the industrial military complex, and it was effect, affecting their pocketbooks. And this was a very, very bitter experience for me, uh, basically the years 1967 and 1968. And I can attribute, to, attribute my coming to Georgetown to be a result of that experience, because I decided I never wanted to have a synagogue <laughs> pulpit uh, again. So, as bitter an experience as it was for me, I'm very thankful because in 1968, I came to Georgetown. Well, we're very thankful to you. <laughs> uh, just kind of just quick comment following up on that. Just the, the March on Washington in 1963 was called the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. And I think the jobs part sometimes is forgotten. So just kind of pulling together mm -hmm. what Professor America said, what you just said, that the, and what, uh, Congressman Norton said, these were all of a piece and completely inextricable. I mm -hmm. think they were for Dr. King and for those of us who, many of us who were activists at the time, that um, justice was a matter of economic justice, uh, the labor movement, jobs, and jobs that paid decent salaries so that to lift people out of poverty um, was inextricable from the issue of race and inextricable from uh, the anti-war movement. It was all of a piece. Three weeks after he was, uh, Dr. King was assassinated, um, I got a call from the National Welfare Rights Organization. I had known one of their organizers and they had a march planned for DC and uh, the pastor Dunbarton Methodist mm -hmm. right here and my, it was my job to bring seven day candles. You've been in Catholic churches, seen those big candles? to bring seven day candles to this march we're having on the Capitol grounds. Um, I was not sure about what exactly was gonna happen, but we lit the candles on the Capitol grounds, um, somewhat aware that you were not supposed to be demonstrating <laughs> on the Capitol grounds and we all got arrested. <laughs> and uh, the same archbishop who had given the invocation um, got a call from our pastor. He had gotten a call from Gino Baroni Baroni said, um, <coughs> we called him late, early in the morning um, and said, we were in jail. Um, would you cover the morning masses? And so the pastor called a boil and said, two of, your, two of your priests, two of my priests, your priests are in jail. And O'Boyle said, that's good. <laughs> that's damn good. Go get them out. <laughs> and Harry Alexander, a judge here in town, had us in for Cokes at about five o'clock the next afternoon. We spent the night in the lockup, but it was, uh, it was quite an experience of, of waking people up to a lot of this parity and this inequity, because the National Welfare Rights Organization was in 1968 trying to get a lot of people into the economy, and still are. Brian, another remembrance of King were his parting words to these young rabbis. And those parting words were, be passionate. And that was what the civil rights movement was about, and that's what the Vietnam pro this was about. That passion united us, blacks and whites, Jews and Christians. It was an amazing experience. And I wonder why that passion doesn't exist in society today because I don't see that passion 
for any movement. And I think it's a great loss uh, for us. Well, historically, the, the black power phenomenon started to kick in around 1967, 68, and that helps explain what happened in, in the next 40 years. And also the two other assassinations, or th perhaps three if you think about Malcolm X. Uh, but John Kennedy, just a few months after the march, and Bobby Kennedy. It's a bloody country. Mm -hmm. Professor Tannen, you wanted to yeah, say, and then I want to open it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll be really, really quick. Um, so, as I mentioned in passing, the women's movement was distant. We didn't think about it. The gay rights movement was distant. We didn't think about it. Um, and she mentioned there were no women on the podium at that march. Uh, Bayard Rustin was gay. I didn't know this myself until quite recently, mm -hmm. though I heard a feature about him on mm -hmm. NPR. I knew the name. All the names that she mentioned were heroes to us at the time. Uh, but apparently his, he stayed and that's why he stayed in the background. Um, so I guess I say that in the spirit of there's still a lot of work to do. We've come a long way and the civil rights movement inspired the gay rights movement and the women's movement, but there's still work to do. I can monopolize their time, but uh, I would, we do want to take an opportunity. Are there any questions that uh, anyone out here would like to ask? There is a microphone we'd like you to use. Oh, I see a hand. Sorry, there's a light in my eyes. Yes. Hi, everyone. My name is Brittany Blakely. I'm a senior in the college um, here at Georgetown studying sociology. My question, which you just kind of like segued into that idea that we still have a lot of work to do, and you all's opinion, so I guess in anyone's um, up there, what is a, a piece of advice or something that you think as students we can do in our daily lives to kind of keep moving towards the work that needs to be done um, on a smaller, more individual scale, just in our interactions with others? Are you a member of the NAACP? I am, yes, Urban League? No. Okay. There's probably a dozen organizations that deserve your support. And they all are the institutional mechanisms that, that need resources in order to, to do the job. They've been constrained by our own lack of support. So. Uh, that was the point of that message, that if, if that became a norm, well, things would accelerate. Just writing checks, that simple. I'm, I'm not one of these panelists who had the opportunity um, to meet Dr. King or, or be at the march. You're but a child. <clears throat> <laughs> I was not a glimmer in my parents' eyes yet, but. <clears throat> I was, I was born in 72, so I've, a few years later. Um, the one thing I heard, and I'm going to connect some dots here, um, the, the march was the beginning of moving civil rights to economic justice and jobs. The, the peace movement and the question about Vietnam also had to do with the way that poor were paying the price for a political uh, policy. And I would say one of the things to keep in mind, and this is, the, for the, uh, this is sort of that economic a business side of things is if we're all economic actors in this society, how we act is, is guiding sort of the principles of our society. So as economic actors making purchases, making decisions about the sorts of things we want to support, organizations certainly how we do our philanthropic giving, um, which is important, but also seeing how do we act with the other purchases we make and what sort of things are we willing to commit to. Uh, you know, in the decision between price and and, uh, and philosophies are, are ones that we have to make as, as economic deciders. But one of the great things about a free market is you can make that decision. So I, I would say that that's probably my one point. I'm picking up my own pieces from what's been set that's up fine. here. So. I, I think too, the institutional piece, the organiz organizing piece, Eleanor Holmes Norton referenced right. it, that organizing piece is integral to the institutions to which you belong. So. How good is Georgetown at being Georgetown, at being men and women for others? How good is Georgetown on the issue of race, of poverty, of peace? How good is your church, your synagogue, your mosque, if you are a church, synagogue, or mosque type person? How do you, how do you influence and push folks in the direction, say that a certain pope is trying to, clearly trying to push a church and rabbis and, um, 
I think incredible numbers of people in the Muslim world are trying to push folks into a direction that recognizes we got billions, a billion and a half, two billion people here who are not worried about the fact that it's 5.30 and what am I gonna have for dinner because they're not sure whether or not they're gonna be able to find any dinner uh, in, the midst of, in the midst of war and that kind of stuff. So we got, we got a lot of that kind of work to do, I think. Just wanted to um, to say that one thing that Congresswoman Northen really impressed me about deeply is when she said, "Learn to organize," and that that may address some of what you're you're saying. Because um, one of the things that came out from all the panelists is that um, I mean, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. It was a, just a small group of students, and look what they did to change things. I mean, it, it really the, the thing that's coming across to me is. A small group of people. Some of them she she called, you know, uh, young, younger than college students. Certainly, um, a small group of people, even one person, can do immense change. So that's one idea that's coming out. I mean, of um, of these panels. So I, I just wanted to emphasize that because um, that's inspiring to me. You know, that small group of people can do that, and then that speaks to the future for me. So anyway, one. Uh, Any other questions or comments? I should point out that there was a, another group that was called the Northern Student Movement, NSM, that was parallel and overlapping with, with SNCC. Uh, and obviously it involved college students in the North, so did SNCC, but uh, uh, many more working in the North because the problem w wasn't just in the South. It was in the big industrial centers and, and so forth in the North. Uh, that that part of the movement hasn't gotten a lot of historical notice, but uh, was out there working. There was another question right here in the front. Hello, my name is Candace Mosley. Um, I basically, as I was listening to you, one of the things that really impressed me was hearing how many of you who were at the march spoke about the variety of people who were there and just how everyone was coming together from these different backgrounds because of this shared struggle. And kind of going to what Rabbi White said, he mentioned that you feel there's a lack of passion now. And I was wondering if you all share that opinion, that that is what is kind of keeping everyone from coming together now, or whether there's a lack of understanding that we have this shared humanity, this shared struggle. Or I guess, what do you think is preventing movements like this from happening today? Is there a movement that you think that could bring everyone together? I'm looking to, to y'all first. <laughs> there are so many that should, <laughs> but trying to think what could. Can I say something? This is maybe a minority report. Um, I've been on this campus. I got real lucky. I got asked by a Jesuit to run a little program. I thought I'd be here for two or three years. I've been here for 21. That's nothing. I, I've been here 35. I've been here 43. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, he always wins. I always win. You will always win. In the 21 years that, that I've been here, i got to say this. Um, I, I don't know whether it's the circle in which I walk or the booth that I grab hold of in the tombs, but the people that I meet, juniors and seniors in college, after that first question, what are you going to do when you graduate, and people look at you like, do? What am I going to do? Duh. The next thing is, ask them what they're doing and ask them what they're involved with. And I get, and I, I'm, I'm, this is, is not the bulk of Georgetown students, I'm told, but the people that I talk to are passionate about a variety of things. And they're the ones that are carrying me along. I, the reason why I get up in the morning, the reason why I show up at 9.30 or 9.25 or 9.32 for a 9.30 class in the morning. The reason why I show up is uh, I get a whole lot of interest in help me figure out what I ought to be doing in this world of ours, whether it's Wall Street or whether it is in developing countries in, in Central South America and Africa. I get a sense an overwhelming sense of people that are looking for a way to make a difference. And is 
that in the water at Georgetown? Maybe some of that's in the water at Georgetown. Is that a self-fulfilling prophecy? God knows, I hope so. But I hear people that are looking for something that they can do that is meaningful, that is gutsy, that is going to make a difference. And they're looking for institutions that are going to help them figure out how they do make a difference. And um, to a guy who's looking at 63, if you want to keep somebody who's looking at uh, 73, I'm sorry, looking at <laughs> 73 years of age, if you want to keep a guy 70, looking at 73 young, ask me, what do you think I should do to kind of move this thing along. I know it's going to be by inches. I know it's going to be something that I can do um, that's, that's relatively smart, small, but it may, it may not be huge. But where, do I, where should I be putting my life? And, and putting, if you have made the decision about where you should be putting your life, how do I put this added thing of my life, how do I make a difference in the rest of the world with what I've chosen to do with my life, whether it's in Wall Street or medicine or arts or whatever, how do I put that together and, and bring this world along? To I'll, my way of thinking, it's, it's, it's very encouraging. I'll do one upmanship on him. I'm 81. <laughs> and uh, what keeps me young? Well, I'm still associated with Georgetown. But what keeps me young is that I still have a vision and a mission. And of course, this is terminology in the Jesuits. It's the relationship between belief and faith. Uh, as I said, Martin King, uh, Luther King was a deeply religious man. Um, he was very, very moved by the fact that the book of Exodus, God says, not by an angel have I done this, but with my saving right hand. King believed that it was God that was working through him. And that makes all the difference. And I think uh, you're all very privileged to be at students at Georgetown, because Georgetown takes religion and mission and vision very seriously. And so if you want to remain young, always have a vision and translate that vision into the mission to do something meaningful. How many of you are in the business school, by the way? Any? Well, OK. Now, you guys, are, you've got the tools. So you'll go out and change the world. <laughs> I, I think that question was such a key question. I'm sitting here wondering, what was the difference that there was this move? I mean, movement is the only word, word we keep coming back to. Something about the 60s, something about the feeling of possibility that people didn't feel as cynical as maybe many do now. Oh, the government is bad, and the, nothing you can do about it. And the 60s were a time when we had these messiahs, messianic figures. King, JFK, Bobby Kennedy, uh, uh, Abby Hoffman. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to think about figures today who represent that type of being, I just can't identify them. Uh, I don't know where they are. As we sort of come to the conclusion of our time here today, the, the one thing I, I want to reflect um, that for me is a real positive um, is the continuation of the legacy that we hear from uh, 1963, sort of the movement of those messiahs who named and called forth individuals to commit to something beyond themselves. Um, and I, I hear it's, and this isn't just patting ourselves on the back. Um, I hear reiterations of that coming up through the generations of students louder and louder with each successive group that I've been a privilege of knowing here at Georgetown, those who want to change the world and are willing to say and commit. And, and I think this is the question for those of you who are, who are graduating. What do I want to accomplish and what mark do I want to leave on this world? Um, do I want to, to make the world a more gentler place, to, to borrow someone else's phrase. Um, and more and more students are Teach for America, um, JVC, uh, Jesuit Volunteer Corps. Um, I've recently had an onslaught of recommendations for Lutheran Volunteer Corps, Methodist Volunteer uh, in Ministry, um, uh, AmeriCorps. Um, taking the opportunity um, to really making that meaningful, I think, 
is both powerful and profound, and I really beginning to hear it reverberate in the generations that I've, I've enjoyed knowing here at Georgetown louder and louder. And I think it's really exciting to see where that eventually takes us as a society and when we have sort of a, this resonance um, of a movement again, so. I, I certainly felt echoes of that kind of excitement and that kind of movement when Obama was elected. Yeah. And we were in public places and there was that same, everybody out in the streets and all mm -hmm. kinds of people sharing that excitement, so. I think it can happen again. And for that reason, I think that it's there. You know, I mean, I think it's, it's bubbling underneath the surface and it's waiting for an outlet to sort of tame it. So you all find it and organize. Yeah. <laughs> you business school people, we're counting on you. <laughs> right. Well, actually, over the last 40 years, uh, business schools across the country have absorbed a lot of the values. So. They don't put a label on it. They might, not e they might even deny it. But the fact is that uh, uh, lots of student groups and alumni groups. These values have seeped into decision making at middle and senior management in corporate America, the, the entrepreneurial phenomenon that's so uh, vigorous across the country now, uh, social enterprise, all these things uh, have their uh, roots uh, in the 60s, I believe, and others who uh, are more objective observers, I think, agree. Uh, so I'm not sure we need a movement. We just need people with the right skills and, and value set, and they will uh, approach problems in a, a rigorous way. They will make investments. They will build enterprises. They'll create jobs. Uh, everything that's happening in Silicon Valley is, is in some sense a uh, manifestation of that. Silicon Valley came out of the hippie movement in Haight-Ashbury in the 1960s. Uh, where I lived after, after my civil rights days. Uh, and uh, when I taught at Berkeley, we, we could see in the early 70s uh, uh, this was, was beginning to happen. So uh, I'm not sure we need a movement. We need millions of decision makers with the right skills, and they'll take it from there. And on that final note, I would wish you all a, a grateful evening. We're thankful for our panelists and for Congressman Norton. Great discussion, great engagement. Uh, hopefully you'll find for yourselves indeed a, a moment to reflect in our Jesuit and Ignatian values of how indeed we can engage larger communities and ourselves in moving different agenda and passions forward. So thank you for coming. Hopefully you enjoyed the conversation uh, and enjoy the rest of the week's uh, festivities related to the Martin Luther King event. There's a student reflection tomorrow, if not in front of Healy Circle, given the weather. I think there's a plan B. Uh, there's a community service day this Saturday. Get engaged. Uh, if you've not seen parts of the District of Columbia, now is your time. Give back. And thanks for coming.